What's going on YouTube? This is Luke with Endless Entrepreneurs just coming to you Sunday evening. We have our sixth episode of uh, our six tips at six uh, with myself and 10K on the Bay, Chris. Uh, Chris, why don't you uh, introduce yourself real quick? What's going on guys? Uh, for, mo for those just tuning in for the first time, my name is Chris and I'm building a 10,000 item eBay store and Luke and I have been doing this show where we share six tips on our process and today we're going to go over um, some sourcing tips and some different categories um, that we go over. Uh, Luke, do you have anything else for our intro? Yeah, and uh, just for those of you new to my channel, so I'm a part-time eBay seller. I specialize in men's clothing. I work full-time as a finance analyst in the corporate world, so I kind of balance both uh, and document it on my channel here. And uh, I'm just really excited. If you're new to this show, um, Chris and I alternate channels each week, and so there's pre-recorded, well, there are previously recorded ones on each of our channels. I encourage you to check them out. Some really good uh, interaction back and forth, and honestly, we've been learning a lot as we go. To stay true to format, we were going to give the tips all up front right now, so we're going to give those in the first half hour. Please hold your questions to the back half, and we'll, we're going to dedicate the whole back half of the show to Q&A, and we do get to most of the questions, so I appreciate everyone uh, weighing in on those. Um, but so let's, uh, let's jump right in. It looks like we're good in the chat with our sound, and Chris, why don't you kick it off? Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, guys, go ahead and feel free to ask questions. We'll just get to them after the first 30 minutes. So the first thing that I'm going to share today is sourcing. The first category that I'm going to sell in is used electronics. And I'm talking about specifically VCRs, laser disc, record players, printers, big bulky electronics that you can find at pretty much every single Savers, Goodwill, Salvation Army, at least for me in California, they're always available, but they're hard to test. There's no TV to hook up to, there's no wires, they have complicated return policies, and for me, it's been very easy to get these at 5 to $10 a piece, uh, especially if I bulk buy and I offer to buy 10, 20 of them. And um, they're a pain in the ass, but I really want to get into it because the margins are exceptional. Like uh, my minimum profit margin I'm looking for is 10x. Um, and the reason is because there's so many returns. Like I just started and I already have over 5% returns on electronics. And I'm anticipating it's going to go around 10, even up to 20% returns because it's old. There's a lot of people who have a record player that's not working. They're going to buy yours, potentially ship their old one back, whatever. There's a lot of funny stuff that happens in use electronics. But I want to prepare myself for it. With the margin being 10x, I'm confident it'll be okay. Um, and then, of course, I haven't really figured out how much time it takes to test these items. It takes a lot longer to pack the items. So um, it's going to be one of the categories I sell in, and I'm just excited to share that because I've never been to a Goodwill and not found at least one of these bulky things to sell. Awesome. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think... I think you're dead on with the margins. I'm not very experienced with them, so I guess some of my questions back to you. I'm listening is, uh, so what's your strategy as you pick them up while you're on a sourcing route? So, and I think I heard you talk about previous shows taking a route, having a route map. So they're bigger, they're bulkier. What happens if you? What happens as your car fills up? I guess is kind of what I'm thinking in my head. Like, how do you handle those type of things? And how do you suggest viewers? So do? for me, I've never found more than ten at any any thrift shop and it's the very end of my thrift route channel or thrift route route because it's the least looked over there's nobody in that section generally because who's really looking for a vcr i mean that's a really a small market if it's just one city versus the whole country is definitely looking for a vcr right and I guess to follow up on that, can you give like uh, maybe your top three finds so far in that electronics category just to share with the viewers on things that may be on the lookout for that you've done well with that haven't been returned? Absolutely. So um, I have I found a Marantz record player. And this is a brand I learned from Craigslist Hunter. He has a uh, show with uh, 10 awesome vintage electronics. And I wrote all those down on my phone. And I look at it in Moran. So I found a Moran's record player. I paid $28 for it. It works perfectly. I replaced the needle. It sounds great now. They're selling between 400 and 500 So 27 to 4 to 500 I'm probably going to pay someone to package it so that it doesn't get broken during shipping because it's worth it at that type of margin. Um, and I So that's one example. I have bought and sold 10 now of the DVD CD or VCR recording devices. So any devices that can dub something from one to the other. And also, I've sold half of those as parts only because I didn't know how to test it. 
So I was saying parts only, no returns accepted. It turns on, but that doesn't guarantee that it's going to work. So you have to know that. As, as, is, as is, and eBay actually allows you to have no returns on that type of stuff. Ah, um, so, bro so broken I, I, as yeah. that's probably old. We could probably talk about that for a long time and the opportunity there. So that's that's a good tip mm -hmm. for sure. Very what's cool. your first What's your first category? Unless you have another question. Yeah, no, no, that's good. You, you covered what I was looking for, so I appreciate you sharing. Uh, so my first category I'm talking about is suits, um, and when I say suits, I mean men's like um, dress suits. So like you know your two button, your three button wool suits you wear to work, and you know I, for me when I think about sourcing suits and, and why it's the first one I picked is similar to what Chris is talking about with margin. So one of the biggest things for me is the margin on suits is incredible if you know what you're looking for. Uh, they are a longer tail item versus I think what some of Chris was talking about is definitely faster flips, um, which is really cool versus, but suits are definitely a longer tail. You need a very specific buyer for them. However, <clears throat> I would say that on average, and especially from our meetup we just had and just chatting with people, most people shy away from them because they think there's too much complexity to it, A, B, they're a long tail item, and three, they're bulkier and a little different to ship and to store. And so for those three reasons, there's more of them to pick from, I found in my experience. Um, the second reason why this really my top one to share with you guys in suits as we dive into the nuances of them is because of all the ri rising prices in thrift stores, suits seems to be the least marked up that I, from talking to other resellers, and I know this is a generalization, but from talking to other people, um, people pricing stuff individually are less likely to know all of the suit brands. They might know some of the common ones, but a lot of the high, high end suit brands aren't as commonly known. I mean, your hundred and two hundred and three hundred dollar ones you're going to flip. They're not as well known versus everyone seems to know those high end dress shirt brands, right? That they're flipping in the stores and they're marking up. So for me, that's another, another reason. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to share when I'm sourcing for suits, I have four distinct things I look for in the order I look for them. So I think it's important to know and to have a plan of attack so you're not overwhelmed with all the suits you're looking at. Because I think, Chris, you can attest, like suits can be very time consuming going to the rack. And if you don't have a specific goal of what you're looking for, it can really take over your whole sourcing trip and derail you. Um, and so the first thing I got to run right here, the first thing I actually look for is material. And I look for material first because I can feel it. Open the jacket up necessarily to know that it could be a winner. And I typically go through every suit um, that I find or an every blazer and suit jacket for that matter. But I know right away if one's the loser because I can feel polyester, right? And I can feel like cheap materials that are kind of like, um, I don't know, I remember one of Mark Cuban's books talking about like the water will bounce off it because it's like the cheap materials, right? It's not the genuine wools and cashmere and silk. So I always look for material first. I look for the brand second. So once I know that it's it could be a good material and I'm okay with it, then I look at the brand. And if the brand is okay, then I proceed to the style or the pattern and the style. So to me, like that order is how I kind of work my way through the rack and determine if I want to pursue looking at it further. So I'm not wasting time opening every single suit as I go. Uh, so hopefully that's a helpful tip. Um, I'll leave it there for now because I have a lot more to expand on as we keep going. Sounds good. So. For me, I know the sourcing price is a little bit different. It costs me $25 a suit here is the average price at Goodwill. It's, a, it's, it's pretty pricey, although they have an insane amount of them, which usually means it's priced too high. They're going to, you can, this, when anybody has too much of something, it's ripe to get a deal. So have you ever purchased a, a bunch of them because they couldn't move them. I'm sure suits are slow movers for them. So where I found the opportunity is estate sales. So estate sales mm -hmm. end up being like, if you are just new to suits and blazers, that's probably the best spot to start because you can usually come away with a huge lot of them and just figure things out and you can get them dirt cheap. I mean, a lot of the estate sales I'm at, they're five bucks for a suit. And that's on like mm -hmm. day one, like on day two and day three and clean out, it's a lot cheaper. And Goodwills, and I'm just going to refer to when I was in upstate New York because I think it's most comparable to like what you're dealing with, Chris, the pricing, and probably what most other people are, is they have things priced way up. So like you're saying, 15 20 bucks a suit, 25 bucks a suit. But they also have sale days. Do you have sale days, Chris? Just going to throw that back at you. Yes, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so the why the suits have the opportunity is 
you can shop on sale days and still find good suits. Whereas you can't shop on sale days and find some of the other stuff in dress shirts and the mainstream categories because people are picking that all week long. The difference with suits is like, you're still going to find those really high end suits sometimes that because people don't know about them, they're not picking them as frequently and you can get them half off for that 1250. Um, so I think that's another opportunity. And like you're saying, Chris, in your area, I know you can wheel and deal. So yeah, for sure. When there's a surplus of them, right, it's just bigger opportunity. And I think it's, and I'll even make the point that for 25 bucks, if you know your suits really well, you're going to find a lot of suits that for 25 bucks, you're still going to buy. Like, you know, you're still looking at 100 to 150 bucks for them. So it's still. Mm, that's still, a great still, point. Still worth it for that investment. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's that's my uh, first tip. If you have any other questions. Cool. Um, so guys, we'll address questions at the end. So the second category that I'm going to try selling a lot of stuff in is used sports equipment. So used sports equipment is abundant where I'm at, and I don't understand it really. But I'm learning tennis rackets. I'm learning baseball bats. I sold my first baseball bat today for $30. I paid three. It ships in um, a priority triangle uh, poster box. So they're like long and thin, designed for this kind of stuff. They're all going to be one or two pounds, which is super light. And they're abundant. I am. I just want to learn specifically tennis rackets and golf clubs um, to start. But I know there's there's other categories. But in that section in California, it, it, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of um, summer leagues and whatever. So I see an abundance of those, and they're very, very, very expensive. At least golf clubs are. I've sold um, multiple sets of used golf clubs for over two hundred. That I purchased for ten or twenty, um, and generally there's something wrong with the set. Um, it's like one iron is broken, or one, you know, one of the irons is even missing. So you have to kind of do some more homework when you're there. Maybe buy the missing one off of eBay to make a complete set. There's definitely a learning curve, and for tennis rackets, I just have this rule that lighter is better, um, as a because lighter is harder to manufacture. So. That's been working out with me as a general rule. If there's five rackets, I'll start with the lightest ones, and those generally are the most expensive, and go from there. Um, yeah, and they're they're big and bulky, and also something that I think eventually I'll be able to figure out a bulk way to buy because there's just so much of it. Um, that's, yeah, that's, I, and I think that's an awesome another awesome category because every thrift store I go into, they're always jam packed with that stuff, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not organized and priced in a way where it's like they carefully went through and knew really well what they're looking at. Like I don't, I don't. That doesn't seem to be the norm where I am. Um, it never was the norm when I was in New York either. Obviously, I'm only speaking for two places, but I think that's great. Now, how? <clears throat> um, and I know we've kind of touched on it in our last week's video of shipping, and, and we're going to do a more detailed one here in the future. But uh, what is then the degree of difficulty shipping something like a golf club versus a tennis racket versus a baseball bat for you? Like how is how has that been for you? How have you adjusted to it? And how does it eat into your margin? So I've been getting um, unlimited golf club boxes for free at just Golfsmith. So I just go to the golf store um, and say, hey, can I have some boxes? The first time I went, I got 40 um, golf club boxes. And they're all the perfect shape because that's what they that's what was shipped to them. So that didn't add any cost there. They're gonna, they recycle all those boxes. Um, the degree of difficulty for packaging golf clubs is very easy. And uh, it's just bubble wrap on both sides. It's very fast. And then um, shipping tennis rackets is, is relatively easy. Um, and I'm just basically one piece of bubble wrap and I'm using packing paper. And awesomely, a very expensive racket will be 10 or 11 ounces. So it's going to be under one pound when you, when you, after you package wow. it all, uh, which is fantastic. And then baseball bats, every single one fits in a priority triangle box. So that, and they're designed to take a beating. So those aren't going to get damaged during shipping, which is fantastic. Gotcha. That's awesome. And what, and, I mean, you referenced like a minimum ROI that you were having an expectation for electronics. Do you have, you have established one for uh, these type of hard good? Yes. So uh, it's just three times. So I'm hoping if I'm going to spend five that I can net um, like 10. If I spend five, I want to net 10. So okay. that's how I um, on golf clubs. And also, I think it will depend on season. I've been picking up golf clubs, but it's also summer right now. Right. So I think later, 
maybe in the winter I will need a higher margin to justify sitting on it longer. Uh, one more tip also, that there's a question in the chat about making sure it matches the set. You need to make sure the, the uh, stiffness of each shaft is all the same. It'll be regular stiff or extra stiff on the shaft. So make sure when you're looking on eBay to compare, because they're different, um, you don't want to get the wrong. You don't want to match the wrong one because then the set will still be not matching and it will not sell for, for very much. Yeah, and this is one area I actually do know about, even though I don't sell in it. But where you'll commonly find a variant in stiffness of the shafts is when you are, if you have a complete set, so like driver three wood, five wood, down through irons. A lot of times, the stiffness in the driver three wood and five wood will be much much different than the iron set. And it's really important to notate that when someone buys it because. Usually someone's swing is dictated on whatever shaft stiffness you select. So um, that's a great point, Chris, and really a good pitfall to avoid. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let me jump over uh, to my second tip here, uh, our category. And it's kind of, I'm sticking similar to suits, but I think that sport coats and blazers are a category of their own. Um, I'm really adamant about that because suits but together, um, and someone made a great point as they said that one of their stores separates all their suits and pants for suits. So a lot of times they can't find suits. Um, and I don't let that discourage you from the main opportunity because this blazer and sport coat genre by itself has a huge opportunity and niche for it for similar reasons as suits. Um, except that shipping for a single jacket is much easier than for the suit itself. And there's much cheaper options, which makes it much more economical to source. Um, I think the competition still is about the same on the suits versus the sport coats and jackets. And I want to dive in on this one a little more detailed into um, kind of my thought process when I'm buying the sport coats and the suits. And I have one tip to kind of blend in with it. Um, but at first, I'm just going to start with brands. I wanted to give everyone a lot of people ask about the brands. And I think that's really just something I think we can add some value today in sharing is uh, these are the top brands I look for and that you can't miss on them if you if you follow kind of the same guidelines. Keaton, and it's believe how you pronounce it, K-I-T-O-N. Like I found it twice. Um, it's not a common one. But because they're not very well, I mean, if you're going to spend the time in the niche, you're going to find them. You find them once a month or once a quarter. It's still worth it because the ROI is so huge. Um, I mean, I'm talking two, three, four hundred dollars for a blazer or a sport coat, depending on the style. I mean, suits, you're talking five, six, seven hundred, depending on the style, the material. Um, Brioni, which a lot of people do are familiar with. Canali, Ermengillo Zegna. Oxford Clothes, uh, Hickey Freeman, and Brooks Brothers, I would consider like my core portfolio on both the suit, the sport coat, and the blazer. And I'm going to blend those together because that brand is consistent across all of them and is profitable. Um, now I'm going to go to like the second tip that comes with this is first, you know, we talk about the tiers of how I source. So brand is very important, but style is also the next most important thing, especially with sport coat style and pattern. So when you're finding a stray jackets or so a stray suit jacket, I'm only picking up that stray suit jacket in that brand if it has a pattern that can be worn without matching pants. Because it's important that you realize getting a stray pinstripe jacket, suit jacket, no one's going to pick that up because it's almost impossible to guarantee it matches the pants they have. It's just the variance of black in a dark navy blue versus a medium navy blue versus a light navy. Like they're they're just it's almost impossible. So those will sit forever and they will not sell. I mean, I, trust me, I have plenty of inventory. I've had to auction off and move. So pattern is important, and just to name a couple is Glen Plaid, Herringbone, and Window Pane are three that you can get away with on a suit jacket selling by itself because they can wear it with like jeans or something else like that. Um, and then the other one is if it's a true blazer, so like navy blue with gold buttons, like you'll see with like the emblems on them, or black with gold buttons, you'll see, or even any of the colors, but the gold buttons, again, it's something they can wear with non-matching pants or jeans or you know for other occasions and it becomes very marketable and you know i guess as an overall tip is just stick to those narrow lanes as you're getting in it and there's huge margins to be had i mean i don't buy really a suit jacket or a sport coat that i can't sell for 40 and i get them for about five bucks um you know other places are very expensive but you can hit your sale days and things like that and there's a lot of brands people just don't know about so um, but there's a couple to kind of get you started Awesome. Awesome. I don't have any more questions on that because it's, it's the same type of sourcing for me here. I just need to familiarize myself. Jackets are, are much cheaper than full suits. They're only 10. Mm -hmm. So if I can find the right one, that'll be a, a definitely no brainer. Uh, I guess I do have a question. What type of ROI do you look for on suits? 
Yeah, no, that's a, a that's good. I should have addressed that. So um, I get my suits for ten in general. They're all ten bucks flatly priced. Um, but if I was to pay up, or no matter what, like I pretty much on a suit, I want five times my money. If I'm not getting five x, it's not worth the time to list it and to let it sit for a year. Sometimes, because that's sometimes right. what it'll sit for. It's, I mean, it can sit for six months to a year. But like for example, I just sold an Oxford clothes suit uh, a little while ago. I've been sitting on it for nine months. I got it for ten dollars. It sold for one hundred and twenty. So mm. for me, waiting that long for that ROI is so worth it. I mean, I shipped it for less than ten bucks. Yeah, mm. it's it's a it's a huge flip, and you find enough of those, and you get that ROI. It's good. And same with kind of suit jackets. Like I'm looking for similar. I mean, five into forty is about the lowest that I'll go, and I offer free shipping and all that sort of stuff. So. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Cool. So my final category that I want to talk about today is shoes. So uh, you guys know I'm trying to get the 10,000 items. I talked to I talked about this extensively with my girlfriend today, and we have decided that she's okay and I'm okay with having 5,000 of the 10,000 B shoes. So literally half of my inventory is going to be used in new shoes, and I just like shoes enough for that to actually be a thing. So yeah. I, I'm really passionate about looking at different styles, leathers, um, you know, sizes. I even like looking at women's shoes. Like it's all gravy to me. There's such an abundance. There are every single garage sale. There are every single thrift store. Um, every kind of sale that there is, there are shoes available. And people always need shoes. So I'm very excited. And um, to give you guys an idea of the margin I'm looking for on shoes, it's 20 bucks. Um, this is kind of an interesting thought, but regardless, uh, I mean, up to, I will spend up to $50 to make $20 profit because of how fast shoes sell. So if it's a popular shoe, I'll spend 50 to only make a $20 margin. That means like 20 selling it for 90, you know, and that 20 bucks still worth it to me because listing a shoe, especially new, there's no measurements. It's the picture sell the item. And I don't have to do very much research because the SKU number will pull up the identical shoe. So, um, and then you can see how many have sold each month, each week. You can see if it's hot or not. And it's just, um, for me, there's such an abundance of shoes that I'm really going to go super, super, super deep into shoes. And a last, last comment on that is that I am learning dress shoes and, um, orthopedic shoes and all and boots all those things too because my previous experience with shoes is all sneakers so mm -hmm. now I'm doing it um, yeah I'm, I'm super psyched about that that's my final category no that's, that's awesome so I have a couple questions just listening to that so 5,000 shoes so yeah. storage the first thing that comes to mind because you put out that number to me and I was like whoa okay so storage mm -hmm. of them yes they're fast movers how are you planning to store that? Because that's a much different game than the current bin system we've talked about on here for clothing. Mm -hmm. so what is your strategy around that? What is your plan as you grow and grow into that? Especially if you start new unbox stuff. I assume you're going to have to keep the box. Yep. To keep the so the, the majority <clears throat> of the stuff that I'm selling does not have a box because I'm starting with use because it's, it's less capital. Um, I can fit 210 pairs on one shelf. So I'm, I'm going to need... Um, it's going to be a while before I hit 5,000 pairs. I only have two or 300 now, so it's a long ways away. But yeah, um, yeah. it's going to be basically 1,000 square feet. So okay. we did the math on it. That's a large space. Yeah. But um, even running at the same numbers as our mutual friend, Tino the Soul Advisor, if I do the exact same model as him, it's over half a million in revenue. So it's enough money to justify a space to store the shoes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that... Um, it's going to be roughly um, 25 shelves. That's a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot. 25 shelves of shoes. Yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's definitely. And I would say um, 8, 12. You could fit 12 comfortably in a one-car garage. Okay. So 12 shelves around... What is that? Twelve times two hundred, two thousand to twenty five hundred in a one car garage, um, with no boxes. New, new it takes up even more, twice as much space, right? Because of the air inside the boxes. So that's one thing to consider. Um, and then 
there's a lot of questions about shoes, so we'll get to that after your final tip. But do you have any questions on yeah. on um, anything no, else on shoes? I don't think I have any. Other, I don't think I have any questions. I know we're gonna get to a lot of Q and A. I don't want to steal them. Um, but mm -hmm. one thing I will, I'm just gonna put in a plug because it's a mutual friend of ours, it's Tino. Uh, he, he has a shoe guy that just came out, and I, I'm not an affiliate for any. Like I don't get rewarded for promoting it, but I just want to tell you, like it's a phenomenal product, and the knowledge that he. The knowledge that he has, if you want to learn about shoes, you should check out him and check out his channel at Tino the Soul Advisor. Or I think it's just the Soul Advisor, sorry. The Soul Advisor uh, YouTube channel. He's just, I've learned so much from him about shoes. I know very little, but I've learned more and more. So I just want to put that plug in before I do my last tip here. All right. So my last category, and sorry guys, I'm sticking to clothing because I'm going to stick to my swim lane, is I'm going to talk about dress shirts. Um, and it's something that actually, I probably know of all the things I sell, that's what I would feel I know the most about and um you know for the dress shirts it's more i just want to talk about the characteristics of the dress shirt i think the brands are well known i think there's enough haul videos and things out there where we really beat the brands to death so i'm going to stay away from that right now um, but i just want to talk about some of the unique characteristics of shirts that make them stand out separate from the brand and what can make a middle of the road brand that maybe doesn't move very well and saturated move quicker because it has some different characteristics that others don't have um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through those real quick. And one of the, the first ones that I'm always on the lookout for when I get to like a saturated market of a dress shirt, like the price is right, the sell price is right, might sit forever, I don't know. One of the first things I look for is, is it non-iron? Um, mm -hmm. Right now, and I want to talk about non-iron a little bit deeper because it, it can be phrased as wrinkle-free, right? There's iron-free, non-iron. I mean, there's a lot different ways wrinkle resistant that that comes across as a keyword or on items um, but to me that's a really important and marketable one because everyone's looking for convenience right the last thing I haven't ironed a shirt in a really really long time like I just don't use an iron it's inconvenient I use a steamer if I actually have to ideally I want to be able to throw my dress shirt in the dryer for five minutes before I'm getting ready for work and it's de-wrinkled any wrinkles mm. are gone and I can throw it on the non-iron material components that make up that really allow me to do that. And so I know from experience, that's a very desirable trait of a dress shirt. So it's one thing that can separate a common brand from its counterparts. Uh, the other is slim fit. <clears throat> um, so like the actual fit of the shirt, slim fit and then trim fit, which is, I believe they're slightly different. I think it's in the cut. It's something that I'm not positive, so I don't want to uh, make any statements that aren't true but slim and trim in general is just being it's something that's a little more form fitting that's a very right now is especially in the trends and style that's a really really desirable keyword as well so if you can mash up slim trim with non-iron like that's a home run for the most part especially if it's a very popular brand and you have those it's even better but again you can separate from a middle of the road brand having those two uh, keywords and making sure i mean they have to be real right they have to be on the tag it has to be the style but i mean those are things that you should be looking for um large sizes i mean we talk about that a lot in other genres but i think in dress shirts it couldn't be more true um extra big and tall type sizes are going to sell and brands that wouldn't sell for standard sizes will sell in big and tall simply because there just aren't that many on the market there's not as many it's more expensive to manufacture them it's more expensive to sell them um looking for those sizes matters and i know that's a little more of a common tip that people probably know uh, and then the fourth one, and this is just a material component one, is that linen, right, and especially during the summer months, but I'll say all year round, linen is a very desirable trait in a dress shirt, um, especially because they can be doubled as casual shirts and regular shirts uh, for, like, dress shirts. And when you work in hotter climates, especially you have those, like, hellacious summers where it's, you know, 120 or 100 degrees in Arizona, 110 degrees, 100, whatever, having linen really, really helps. Um, and it, it, I, all my linen stuff moves very, very fast compared to other things. So those are just four kind of key areas that separate, you know, outside of brand. Because we talk about brand all the time. I think that's an important one. Uh, so I'm just going to leave that there. And that's kind of my, my last tip for today. I have a couple of questions on your dress shirts. Yep. One is, have you seen shaped fit? Because I have a shaped fit here. What do you think that is? So I actually don't know. I don't want to try and say I don't know. I know that shape fit is in the kind of another, I think it's another way to say trim fit. Yeah, I usually see it on Bugatti Yomo the most is where I see yep. shape fit. Um, I think it's their way of saying trim and slim. I could be wrong. And if anyone in the chat can let me know, I would appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I think it's just another way of saying um, it's kind of 
they probably are tapered is what I've noticed. They're a little more tapered probably around the shoulders and the chest area, but that's my guess. So I just want to talk strategy for a little bit. That's really literally what I got from was a Bugatti shirt. So obviously <laughs> Luke knows what's up when it comes to brands. Um, so I'm going to try something and I want to hear your thought on it. I've been doing um, quite a bit of retail arbitrage um, recently, specifically like Marshalls. And I'm going in, today I went to Marshalls, I bought Robert Graham, um, Thomas Pink, uh, Bugatti, and um, English Laundry, which is not the best brand. Now here's the thing, they're expensive, right? So I, I spent $100 on only six shirts. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm thinking is I'm actually going to auction them just to drive traffic to my store and start them at break even. Because the margins aren't really that great. I'm, I'm, ba I'm barely gonna double my money. But right. I'm just thinking um, maybe since I have some of these things in my, in my store, uh, I'm wondering how you feel about driving traffic with a new item because I don't typically use auctions, especially on pre-owned when the market is the market. For example, a Thomas Pink shirts were twenty-five dollars pretty much forever. Well, at least that's, recently, I haven't. Yeah, you know, it's been standard. pretty pretty stable. So I wonder what you feel on auctions um, because yeah, I just I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, it's funny you bring that up because. So I've been reading a little bit from other resellers in the community and seeing that a lot of people have been using and experimenting auctions with new tags type stuff, especially it's slower than summer right now. And uh, the one good point about that and you brought up is more, I feel like it's more of an economic standpoint is there is going to be a ceiling for the new items that probably someone who buys them in massive quantities has set, right? And so if you mm -hmm. can find what that is, you know what you're playing with in between. So let's just, I'm just going to take 40 bucks as an arbitrary number and this is how I view this. So let's just say, the new with tags, who got you Omo is at 40 bucks, just to say. It's probably higher than that. But let's just say there's a seller who's selling a ton of them and they're all at 40 bucks. Mm. You set it at 1850, which is about your buy cost right around there, right? Like 18, 17 bucks. Mm -hmm. And your auctions, as long as they land somewhere in between there, you're making money. It may go up to two or three dollars below the, the ceiling if it's a very mm -hmm. desirable pattern. It may land in the middle. But no matter what, like you said, you're driving traffic, you're making money, and you already have like a ceiling and a floor set. So no matter what, you're winning. And it probably takes way less time to listen to a tax item. You're buying a lot more. Right. Of them. So yeah, I think that's it's a, a cool really strategy. Point. That's a great point. But you totally understand the ceiling and the floor. You don't have to lose money on it. You can right. you can set it you can set the auction at your exactly the minimum you'll take for it. Yep. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, even if you strike out, I think the cool part about what you're trying is who, you know, the fall comes and say you, you, your auctions come empty for a couple of months, you flip them over to fixed price, you get what you want for them and they'll sell mm. it for quarter comes because they're new at tags anyways. Mm. So true. I mean, that's, that's kind of the other cool part with them. I didn't even think about that, that, um, the fact that there's a floor and a ceiling that, that, you know, you know, the floor cause you bought it, you know, the ceiling cause there's tons of sellers who have 50 of the same item. Right. You can take a look at, huh? So that'd be my thought. Great. I think we're we're good on tips, guys. So I want to jump in. We're gonna there's there's a bajillion questions, so this should be a very full Q and A. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. If you've seen one you want, I'll let you take the first one. I'm gonna scroll up and I'm gonna make sure I don't miss a bunch here. I'm gonna start from the top so you get some. Um, Holy cow, guys! <laughs> I know it's intense, right, guys. Um, and I, by the way, I meant to apologize for my uh, ad hoc background here. I am in upstate New York at my parents' house. Just got out of the basketball tournament, so I'm crowded in our spare bedroom here trying to make it work. Um, Denise is asking, are there special brands I look for in electronics? Um, so I do look for basically anything Japanese. So Marantz, Sony, Panasonic, Yamaha, all those brands are really good. You can obviously use your phone and research, but basically anything Japanese. I also look for Pioneer, sells really well for me. And anything, obviously Apple, even if it's old, will still sell well for me. About a bunch of MacBooks, a bunch of um, Mac key or um, mice and keyboards and everything Mac related uh, sells really well for me as far as electronics. So that's that question. What about you, Luke? Did you find one? Um, yeah, hold on. So I'm seeing a lot of similar questions about like brands and materials and what's best to pick up and uh, kind of the suit sport code. So I'm just going to answer it like kind of generically because I think it'll answer a bunch of questions all at once mm -hmm. is when I look for suits and blazers, 
Um, the, the materials that I only will pick up are wool, cashmere, and silk for the most part, and mm. camel hair. Those are the four. If it's not those four, I don't mess with them. Uh, and a lot of people are, are asking, like Joseph A. Bank, a couple of things. Like the brand knowledge and research really just needs to be done on eBay. I mean, I gave you a core of seven to go with. Uh, Joseph A. Bank is kind of the bottom of what I would touch. Um, but definitely solds and completed are going to be your best friend, especially when you're just starting to learn. You want to look up every single one before you buy it just because the buy cost is a little higher. Uh, so hopefully that helps answer some people's questions there. There's a comment here saying that there's not a lot of name brand suits in their area. I just want to make the comment that I did not know that there was a Goodwill boutique in, my, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, but yesterday I found it. Um, I wasn't even, I was just hanging out with my brother in San Francisco and I saw a Goodwill boutique and we walked in there and that's where all the nice suits were. So I imagine that, and all of them were between 25 and $75, which is pretty pricey. So um, I just want to make the point that your Goodwills may be sending the nicer inventory to some, either to their eBay store, because 72 Goodwills have eBay stores, or they might be have a boutique that they send stuff to. So don't get discouraged, keep looking. Um, and it's it's good that you know that if your goodwill never has any suits, then don't continue to look for those there. Look for other types of things that might be there. Yeah, I I think that's a great point because I mean I I'm in a bubble where I live with sourcing, so I don't deal with that a lot. But that it does happen all over the country with the boutique type stuff. So um, don't get discouraged and make sure that you're. It, I would hit a lot of your local thrift stores too outside of the chains because I think that like some of the smaller like church mom and pop stuff will have a lot more um, in that that way it's even garage sales and stuff will have a lot of those things i also see a question or it's not really a question it's a statement but i kind of want to address it. it says i have 15 shirts that i have enlisted because i have to iron them or steam them um mm. uh, and i'm just going to kind of give a tip that might, some people might not agree with just list them like don't mm. don't wait if that's the only thing preventing you from listing them and making money back on them just list them uh, i think you'll be very pleasantly surprised that it doesn't matter as much as you think um I, I, I get criticized all the time that I list things that look too wrinkled. Um, I just sold three shirts today that all I can tell are wrinkled in my, my, <laughs> my pictures. And they still sold for what I expected them to sell for. Do um, you put in the description, <laughs> uh, I put in mine, or I used to, please wash it when you, um, I'm sorry, before you wash it, try it on to see if it fits. And when I was doing that, um, I wasn't getting any returns, and my stuff was super wrinkled. So people just try it if they liked it. That way, to give them a chance to return it right away. Right. They really didn't like it. Instead I, of waiting. So I don't put that in there, but that's actually a really good idea. Um, I haven't already thought about that. But in general, I mean, I always think about someone's buying a used item, they're going to wash it before they wear it, period. So that's why I don't worry about the wrinkles as much, right? Like, I don't think it prevents mm. them from visualizing how the shirt's going to look because it's wrinkled. Like, they know how to use an iron or to steam something. <laughs> So like, don't don't let that prevent you from listing it and being kind of paralyzed and not making the money back on those items. Um, I have a question. There's a bunch of questions on store categories, which is not really related to our topic, but I still want to answer it because we yeah. hear it a lot. So how you make store categories is you forget to subscribe to a store, and then in my eBay, click on Manage My Store, and there you can adjust your, your categories. But I want to make a really important point that was really stressed to me when I went to eBay. Um, for a Q&A at the headquarters, and they're saying that the store categories are not sent to Google for the SEO ranking. And the reason is because you can just make up your own um, category. So obviously, Google's not going to have an algorithm for that. You could put like uh, men's clothes, men's shoes, clothes, clothes and toys, clothes and vintage, clothes and bananas. Like it, it doesn't, it's not a drop down menu. So stuff that's not in a drop down menu is not sent to Google. So you'll see tons of successful stores with no store categories because it doesn't necessarily help you rank better on Google, but it does help people inside eBay and your customers search your store better, but it's not sent to Google for, for SEO. Yeah, I think that's a really good tip. I used to get hung up on store categories all the time, and I don't even bother updating mine anymore. I haven't updated or, I mean, I do still similar, so it automatically classifies them if it already had one, but I don't right. really take the time to vet them at all anymore. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, question. What exact tasks do you have your employees perform everything or just item form input? I'm going to default this to Chris because I don't really have a lot of experience with that whatsoever, so it's all you, Chris. When I have my employees do it, it starts <coughs> to finish, so 
they get it like this in a, in a shirt and they bring it back to me like that package and ready to ship so they, they do the entire thing the only thing that I was keeping for myself was pricing so there's so many ways to handle employees some people only do photographs some people only do product research some people only those and the listings they just do the uploading part so however you want to do it uh, I would start though as far as my tip for getting into employees is hire a helper first and then it's worth it to pay your a family member a pizza or something to watch you do the eBay process and then the, like they'll probably be able to tell you right away what you need help with someone just watches you do eBay for 30 minutes they're gonna say man you really don't like taking pictures it took you forever to do that or you know whatever part of your process is the bottleneck if you just hire one of your friends or family or bribe them with food they'll give you an idea and I think whatever your weakness is hire help there first yeah that's a great tip and a great perspective on if you're looking to get help or branch out into it for sure all right guys we got about 15 minutes left in Q&A we have 134 watching live so that's awesome I appreciate you guys stopping please hit that like button we have 36 likes right now hopefully we're adding value you know, help us out and like the video. Let us know that uh, you're enjoying the content, and we will keep answering questions. Uh, side hustle resellers ask, do you guys see yourself moving fully towards wholesale, both of you? I think that's a very interesting question because I think Chris and I talk about this probably a lot more than other topics. Uh, do you want to take it first or do you want me to take a shot at it? I'm going to move 100% to, having my, um, to not leaving my house. I want to either have buyers go out and thrift for me or garage sale for me or hunt. I don't have a the, – the, the reason why I don't have that already is I don't know what I'm looking for yet. Once I have an idea or a target ROI, I think I can, I'll be able to hire a buyer. And what gives me confidence in that is every single company that's a company does that. Every single brick-and-mortar store that you see in America, there's a buyer. If it's full of inventory, someone's job is to buy stuff. So – Definitely moving towards away from one-offs as soon as possible. But the margin is really high with one-offs. So the, my, my one thing that I hear, heard over and over again when I was listening to large sellers is you build your margin with one-offs and you build your business with um, replenishables. So um, you can't, yeah, the margins are whatever they are on wholesale, but um, the, you, know, you can't really adjust your margin. That's that's like spot on perspective right there. I, I hope everyone was listening to that because that's, I mean, that's really how you're deciding how you're going to move forward. And, you know, I'll answer the question for myself of, yes, I would like to eventually move all the way towards wholesale. Um, but right now, one-offs provide the margin we're looking for, A. B, for me, I'm part-time. So one-offs are all I really have time to handle from a space perspective. Um, and the last part of it is that one-offs and the way we're building our business now allows to build capital to be in a position to do wholesale. So one component of wholesale is that you need capital and you can do it two on two ways, right? You can, there's lots of ways to leverage and get credit and do that. I'm personally not trying to go that route. Um, that's just not my preference of risk tolerance and threshold. So I'm trying to build capital to leverage into it in a little different path. Um, so I think everyone has their own path they're looking for, but yes, I'd like to move towards wholesale. Here's a couple of quick questions. I think we can, you can, why don't you take these ones? Um, okay. in the future, do you want employees or 1099 and would you be interested in consignment? Never probably going to be interested in consignment. I just don't want to deal with the extra inventory flow and tracking of it. Uh, to me, it's just an extra complexity that I can't streamline. And when I make the move from doing one-offs to wholesale, it just doesn't really fit that model. So I don't want to add the complication on the front end. Um, the other question was about 1099s versus employees. When I started to mm -hmm. add help, they're probably going to start as 1099s because it's going to be more of like contract prepping of inventory um, mm -hmm. for yeah, on a piece rate basis. So it'll probably be 1099s for a while. And then that will transition once I've had experience and learned from it into more of a full-time employee at some point managing more of like the wholesale space. Um, but I don't think I'll need a whole full-time employee until I get to the wholesale model. How about you, Chris? Um, I would consider doing consignment if it's really, really expensive and they handle 
they absorb a return, which is like impossible to set up because they're gonna have to wait till the return policy expires. But like it needs to be expensive. Like I had considered going to a jewelry store in the Bay Area and listing every single one of their items on eBay and making because their margins are insane, right? Every single item is a thousand dollars profit. But um, I'd have to wait until the return policy to really count or ended before I could count that money as money. Um, and even your credit card, you can file a charge by up to six months. So consignment is already complicated. So it'd have to be a pretty high margin for me. And then it's always fuzzy when it comes to returns because they want their money as soon as you get the money. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. <laughs> uh, question for you because you're the shoe guy in this episode for sure. What is the most common way that you ship your shoes, Chris? So the most common way I ship my shoes is bubble wrap inside of a padded flat rate envelope. Uh, if it's very nice, I will build a box around it and put that box inside the padded flat rate. And then other than that, I will um, reformat a large mailing box from USPS and ship priority. Originally, I was messing with FedEx Smart Post because it's 4 or $5 cheaper. But I haven't had any customers complain about the extra shipping cost if they get it faster. So I'm not just sticking with priority. Um, also, I'm considering pre-boxing them, but, um, which I can do right now while, I, while I'm small. But when I get bigger and space becomes an issue, I may have to store them loose and then pack, pull, and ship. But short answer, padded flat rate if it's women's shoes because they're smaller or medium flat rate box or Frankenstein boxing, uh, USBS large mailing box. Gotcha. Uh, quick question here was what about vintage, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Bang and Olufsen, Olufsen? Uh, I have no idea, I've never heard of that brand of you, Chris. Yes, that's a, a old school uh, audio, you know, audio file brand. It, it's amazing. So Harman Kardon, um, that brand. I don't know how to pronounce it. There's there's so many vintage electronic brands that disappeared, like when the world of the MP3, when everyone switched to headphones. So many of these audio companies were destroyed. So that's why they're so valuable. Because there's, there's a lot of audio files that love listening to that stuff, and the new generation is all about. Wireless right. headphones. There's another question here about: Do you guys care about top-rated sellers? So, um, go ahead. I'll you answer that, and I'll, I'll answer it as well. I've never been top-rated seller, so I think it will be. Um, I have a between a five and eight percent late shipping, so um, that is a problem, and I really need to fix that. So, I assume it will give me a boost in sales, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, I have a very similar response. I don't have it, and I haven't had it. Um, mine's actually from mostly from my defect rate, which is a little embarrassing, but it has to do with, because I'm a long tail seller, so my very, very old inventory um, is not wasn't well kept and wasn't have the same inventory system I have now, so it either occasionally is damaged or is can't find it when I move from North Carolina, or from New York down to North Carolina. So I've actually been taking steps to start auctioning and moving some of that stuff to try to get my defect rate down because by the end of the year I want to have it. So um, I do care about it. I just don't currently have it. <laughs> Here for me, it says, what is your rule on moth damage on wool, camel hair, et cetera? My rule on that is I don't buy anything flawed in the suits and blazers category with the exception of like some really, really high-end brands like Keaton or Kitan. I think someone corrected me on the pronunciation. Um, I have picked up some stuff that's a little war, but holes I don't pick up. More of just like iron marks or things like that for a brand like that. But in general, like if there's a flaw, I don't pick up it at all. It's just not worth it. We've got Rick and Profits in the house. Um, What's going on, Steve? I'll see you in a couple days, man. It's not too far away. Green Room Meetup. I know. I'm missing the Green Room Meetup. I'm so mad. Guys, we're both also members of the Green Room and not affiliates. So. Um, you guys should definitely be out there networking, meet people. And uh, for me on moth damage, I learned this from Steve Rakin. You want to hold the garment up to the light because you can easily not see the hole until you get home. So uh, especially since a lot of thrift stores, especially here, are dark. Yeah, that's um, a great tip. Try to, try awesome to hold tip. it up and see. And, and try not to buy flawed anything. 
because you don't factor in the time to fix it ever. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's just, and I don't think you really ever recover that time invested. It never makes, I don't know. I, I very rarely, the extra time it takes never makes, adds that much value to it. Um, what else we got here? You see any questions you want to grab? There's a comment here that there's a guy that's working for commission by listing products on Craigslist, Amazon, eBay for pawn shops. I think that's a, this is like a classic example of leverage. So this person is used leveraging the inventory that a pawn shop has. He probably, he doesn't have to pay for it, but somehow he's worked out access to it to list it on eBay. So he's making a commission on potentially thousands of dollars worth of inventory without actually owning it. Very clever, great way to do it. Um, zero inventory in hand if somebody else is um, holding the inventory. But again, it gets kind of complicated because if um, that, that's actually very unique because there is a time period when pawn shops cannot put it on the floor. They have to wait to see if it's stolen or not before they can send it. So if you're listing it before it hit the floor, then there'd be no chance of it selling like somebody bought it at the store and you, you went there to, to do that arbitrage. But that's a very clever way of um, hacking it. But um, you'd be completely reliant on that pawn shop. Yeah. That's interesting. That's very interesting. There's a question here, and I'm not sure I know the answer. It's from Jeff. It says, what's the difference between sell similar and sell one like this? I don't think there is a difference, but Chris, are you aware of any of this difference? I don't know why I see both. I don't think there's a difference because it still returns no. the filled out listing from the item you clicked it on. Which is the whole I feel like sometimes result. I see have one to sell also. Yeah, that's if it just, I think it just depends on the screen you're in. So like okay. with, with based on like how you found the listing and where you're click like when I click on it from my active inventory page, I get so similar. When I click on it from my sold page, I think I get the sell let one like this. And if I click on the listing, uh, one that's live, like an actual live listing, is when I get sell one like this as well, I believe. Or have one to sell similar to this or something like that. Canadian Bacon is recommending that we both become top rated sellers. It's both right on the top of our list. So <laughs> we want to do it for sure. It's yeah, not like we're I, purposely mean, not doing it. I know that you get cut. I mean, you get better shipping rates and final value yeah. fees. So it's, yeah, it's definitely we're definitely, I want to have a perfect and zero late shipment fee, no defects. Trust me. Yeah. I'd love to tell you guys that I'm a great, a perfect seller and have the most efficient processes and nail top rated. I just, it's not true. I mean, juggling that in my full-time job, I fall short quite frequently. So, so working on that, working on building those processes out. Um, so DJ's asking about USPS priority shoe boxes, which I use, and they are not flat rate. So um, every area is going to be different. If you live in the middle of the country, it's your priority all day. Yeah. yeah if you're in the middle of the country, priorities, <laughs> that's nice. It's a good place to sell shoes from. Tino probably knows that more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, what else we got? We have a person with only one late shipment. That is awesome. I I, I have around um I have a lot of late shipments. And I, I also offer same day shipping. So if I switch that to one day shipping, I'm sure I, I would be top rated, but I'm trying to be one day shipping. Yeah. I have I actually incurred one this weekend Percentage. because I switched all my handling to four days and for some reason like two items didn't update my inventory and of course one of them sold. <laughs> and I didn't realize it until the shipping label is late, so that's always fun. Mm -hmm. Um take maybe two more questions and we'll probably wrap up here. So if you see one sure. you want to grab, you go ahead. I really like this um, concept in the Sun by the Beach is mentioning that there are people that do uh, consignment for estate sales. Guys, you can be very creative, especially when you don't have money, to find different ways. You could list your stuff of your friends and family. You could go to a pawn shop. You could go to um, a repossession center where they where they are about to auction people's stuff. There's insurance auctions. There's a lot of different ways you can find inventory for free. You can search the free, sec free section in Craigslist. And all you have to do is be good at one of those to get going. Yeah. I don't recommend drop shipping at first because you need enough feedback to, to absorb some problems that may happen. So that's the only model I recommend being very careful for if you're a beginner. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. 
That was a um, pretty good one there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I see there's one a comment from Jay. And it's, he's saying that our shoes don't fit in a regional A box. It's kind of a question. Not um, always. I, I know that some of my smaller pairs will fit, but most of the – anything medium to large for men's shoes will not fit in that for me. And I, I sell mostly dress shoes, uh, so that's – um, probably mm. some women, probably women's shoes fit a lot easier in there, but a lot of women's shoes are probably can fit in a fat, padded flat rate too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, all right. Are you, you good? Do you see anything else you want to grab real I fast? I think we're good. I think we smashed everybody's good. comments. Everyone make sure to hit the like button before you leave. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I just want to thank everyone for stopping by at 130. You know, I know this is a little later than we normally do on Sunday. I appreciate everyone's flexibility and stopping in. Uh, I've just been traveling, so trying to make sure we bring you the show every week, no questions asked. So um, just really appreciate that, guys. And we will be back next week on Chris's channel, 10K on the Bay. If you haven't checked out his channel, please go. There's a link in the description. Check it out. Subscribe. He's got great content there. Uh, and we will be back next week with another topic for you guys. Uh, have an awesome day. And uh, like you said, hit that like button on the way out. We appreciate it. See you guys. See you guys.